Okay. Um, well, well, first thing first, I think after Professor Zellner's lecture and his views on the subject of Bayesian econometrics, Bayesian statistics, um, and the entire gamut of topics that he has covered, I think anything that we are going to say is going to be more of a repetition. But I think repetition is also required. And that is what the purpose of this is. Um, well, this session is really called very simple Bayesian basics. Even the Bayesian basics, you know, it, the title is a little bit, um, has, uh, one can say that has a very wide scope. There are a whole lot of issues. It's really an ocean by itself to say Bayesian basics, and one hour for that is really not enough. You know, if you want to learn music, you have to begin with Do, Re, Mi, R, as we say, Sargam. When you want to learn a language, you begin with the alphabets. So if you want to be a Bayesian, you want to learn Bayesian econometrics, you have to begin with the Bayes theorem. And that's really the very basic thing. Now if you want to become a Bayesian, we have to also, like we can teach you music in one hour, we really, one cannot really cover even the basics of Bayesian methods in one hour. But what I'll try to do is to go over some of the important issues and try to see how we can link up with various other lectures that we have planned during this meeting. Um, so the overall plan is to provide you with what I call as a Bayesian toolkit. This is what, you know, whenever you want to do something, you need some tools for it. So that's what I'll call as a Bayesian toolkit. We want to provide you the Bayesian tools. Um, the second part would be, well, again, not as extensive and intensive both what Professor Zellner covered, but Bayesian versus the frequentist approach. Um, in a more simpler way, I'll try to cover the topic. Something more on the prior distributions. The next part would deal with the posterior distribution and Bayesian computing, which is a very important aspect of the Bayesian methodology. And of course, finally, I will just discuss some open problems. It may not be complete, but I, would be, I will uh, pose a few problems and the questions. The idea is, as I always I mentioned in, my, uh, in the welcome um, talk, that we really are trying to motivate you. That's the main objective, that we motivate you. And of course, hope that you will all get initiated into this so that you'll be able to go back and whatever problems you're working on, try to use the Bayesian methods. <clears throat> it's all very simple, as I said. I'm hoping, I'm really, in fact, I'm, I'm presuming that some of you are sitting here are perhaps listening to the whole concept of Bayes theorem for the first time. There are some of you who have already attended this workshop earlier and also have been teaching this maybe at a uh, you know already you are aware of the basic facts of it but given we want to bring everyone at a homogeneous level so i would go over the basics very much so the bayesian toolkit contains three items i would call one is the data distribution the prior distribution and the posterior distribution. I think the term data distribution is something that all of you are familiar with because most of you have worked with either statistics, R econometrics, some kind of a modeling. So you have always worked with some data distribution. But what is something new that the Bayesians talk about is this term, the concept what we call as the prior distribution. Well, the assumption is that when you are a researcher, whatever application you work with, when you build a model, the presumption is that as a researcher, you always have some idea, uh, some intuitive idea as to what, this, uh, what, the, what the model is going to behave. You really don't know the exact value of the values of the parameters, but you have some idea. If you're really working with uh, <coughs> consumption function, then you say, well, Marginal propensity to consume is the parameter of interest. In that case, you, are, you know that the theory gives you some idea that it's, tells you that it's going to be between 0 and 1. Our, well, let's take much simpler than that. Talk about just averages. Averages interest everyone, whether you're a statistician or an economist, whether you're an applied researcher, you're working with finance. Average, very simple number, just one parameter, 
averages interest you and if you're concerned about the average whatever problem you may take you have some idea well it could be that we have talked we have talked about this morning about the gdp growth rate people saying between 6 and 6.5 percent well this is what you're really saying is the average rate of growth of gdp is some number so well that's really the figure that's coming out to you but even before you start having any kind of a model or trying to estimate it you have as an economist as a researcher you have some prior notion prior belief about it some idea about it and this is all that has to be translated into what the Bayesians call as prior distribution. Of course, the question more on this a little later, how do we actually specify a prior distribution in any given situation? Uh, more on this I will talk about a little later. Well, what is the next term, what we call as a posterior distribution, which of course we have already seen in the morning in uh, Professor Zellner's lecture. Um, we have to do it data distribution, prior distribution, we need to really put it in some kind of a mixture, some machine, which should finally give us what we call as a posterior. Posterior, after the data and the prior have been combined, what comes out of it? So let's see, the toolkit all packed together gives us the all-powerful Bayes theorem. Again, well, it's just repeating that, but let me give a definition of that. So you have given the observed data, you have n observations, then the conditional distribution of this parameter theta, if you have the only one unknown parameter in a very simple situation, is the simple form of this being given, the p theta given y is the product of the p y given theta times p theta over p y. And what are all these, what is the description of all these terms? I will um, go over this. Well, P y theta is nothing but your data distribution that most of you have worked with the classical setup, with the frequentist setup, you are familiar with, uh, well, this is nothing but another way of looking at it as a function of theta, not of y, is the usual likelihood function. So this is something that looks very familiar. We all know that whenever we do statistical modeling, data analysis, we have likelihood function. Um, P y theta is also called the joint probability density function of the data, the, the observations y1, y2, yn. What's the second term there? P theta, which tells us what is known about theta without the knowledge of the data. Well, uh, this is what we call as the prior distribution because this is something prior to the entire exercise, the entire research that you undertake. This is something that you already believe in that. This is what you have the degree of belief, so that's your pay theta. P theta given by tells us what is known about theta given the data is called the posterior distribution. Well, how do we actually get that? As he said, that's the machine that you put in um, called the Bayes theorem, and that gives you the posterior distribution. While we have this term here, if we go back to the Bayes theorem that we that I wrote here. We have here four terms. This term here in the denominator is nothing but the reciprocal of the normalizing constant C. And if you have theta as continuous, then it is defined, it, it's written as the integral over theta because we're looking at only single parameter situation. Of course, extensions, it would have to be rewritten. A single parameter case, you have a parameter is continuous. Even if you're talking about the averages, is integral over theta. You, you have your data distribution times the prior distribution, d theta that gives you the py, and of course if your theta is discrete, it's nothing but the summation over these quantities. Now, a simpler way for somebody who's going to begin the Bayesian work, it's much simpler to look at the Bayes theorem as a very simple um, expression where the posterior distribution is nothing but the product of is proportional to the product of the likelihood times the prior. So if you look at it, we have already got something different from what the classicists are doing. We are not really talking about only the data distribution. Whatever you do, whatever problem you take, whether it's estimation, whether it's uh, testing, whether it's model selection, whatever problem that you deal with, our forecasting, we are going to have, you have the data, 
times the prior, that's when you come up with the posterior distribution. So posterior distribution is nothing but proportional to the product of these two terms. As I said, much of it is going to be the repetition of what has been done earlier. But again, we want to make sure that you get motivated, you get initiated, and you go back and ask yourself, well, if I have this problem, I'm working in area of finance, I'm working with some applied problem relating to industry, then what is it so different about the Bayesian approach? Well, you're always used to working with data, but here you have to think, well, where do I get my prior, where do I get my prior distribution? Well, more on this would be coming in the lectures which are going to come. <coughs> so in the simple one, one parameter situation, what do we have is that Theta is the unknown parameter. You have some data. You combine it with your prior data. The prior apply Bayes theorem, and this is the result that you find out. Well, we have already said this. Obtain the posterior distribution. Um, yes, I think this has already been said. Uh, well, that was just really your basic that you have, that you always have to talk about, you have to always have to apply the Bayes theorem. Well, it's time to, in fact, also go into detail and try to look at it. What are the different ways in which we can try to look at the differences between the Bayesian versus the frequentist approach? And I would like to discuss it again with respect to the following points. And the first one being that is the amount of information that is required. Okay, well, with respect to that, frequentists are the classicists, only use the data information. But if you're a Bayesian, then you're going to use data plus prior. And of course, this would tell you a priori that you must really improve on your results. You must do better than a classicist because now you have the data plus something more than that, and that's your prior information. So the first point of difference, major difference, that you would look at the two approaches as to develop any problem would be with respect to the amount of information that is being used. <clears throat> the second important difference between the Bayesian and the frequentist approach is with respect to the format of the question. What is the format in which you ask your question and the format in which the answer is provided. Okay. Well, if you are a classicist, while well, you talk about average, then what is it to really ask? You talk about what is the average expenditure, what are average sales, average revenue, average growth rate, and essentially you are asking for one a particular value. This is really the general notion when you talk about the, the class Classicists will ask a question which is only thinking in terms of one particular value. Well, if you want to be, uh, you want to say something more than just one value, what the frequentist will provide you is an interval estimate. So a frequentist is only going to provide you either a point estimate or an interval estimate. Because the question, the way it is asked is this, what is the average growth rate? Or what is the average expenditure? What's the average revenue? What are average sales? It implies that you're really asking for one particular value. Well, of course, as I think uh, Professor Zellner mentioned in the morning, when you ask this question, it really becomes gets a very limited value. If you want to have a more meaningful question, whether it relates to growth, production, expenditure, sales, what's more meaningful is, while we're talking about an unknown quantity, and of course, trying to be satisfied with just one particular value for this unknown quantity is really asking a question in a very narrow and a limited sense. What you really want to do is you want to ask a much broader question. The question should be not really trying to get one value, but what really would you want to do? Um, uh, the, the answer that you provide should be such that it will satisfy will provide a much wider and more general answer. And that can only be done when you provide a whole distribution, a range of values. When you not only you try to say that the average growth of average rate of growth of GDP is just trying to give one number as six percent or six point five percent, you would like to give a probabilistic statement of all the values. You would like to, in fact, give an answer which will say, well, the probability that the rate of growth of GDP is um, three percent, the probability is uh, while you try to give an in, provide an interval, it, and that it's between um, um, 
it's whether it's 10 percent or 15 percent are the probability that the rate of growth of GDP is going to be much higher you assign probability to it so in fact one should get a whole picture a clearer picture of it as to what is really the average value what is the like what is the possibility that the rate of growth would be smaller or larger and that is what is going to give you a, a better understanding of the whole problem rather than just providing one number and of course that's what frequently happens when you do an estimate when you do an exercise when you estimate and you provide one number and of course when uh, at the end well, uh, but in fact when you really go back and look at um, in post trip uh, introspection when you look at it you find that the number that you really provided doesn't work out well because it is really difficult to come up with an exact value of an unknown quantity so that's where the greatest advantage of the bayesian approach lies is the kind of the format of the question that is being asked and the way the answer is provided bayesians are looking for a much wider answer and this is the bayesian approach would be able to provide that um well, the third, and again, a very important advantage and very important distinction that one would be able to make between the frequentist and the Bayesian approaches with respect to the unified approach. Do we have a unified approach? Well, we pose this question for both the approaches. And we find that when, when you take the classical uh, or the frequentist approach, you find that there is no single approach which is applicable for all kinds of situations that we deal with. If you have a time series data, you have different kinds of approach. You have a cross-sectional data, different approach. Panel data, where you have single equation, multiple equation, and so on. So when you have different problems, the, uh, you have a different approach for that. But what about the Bayesians? What do they have? Whether you have a problem of estimation, testing, model selection, forecasting, Bayes theorem, is the key to the answer is the answer is the only approach that is used in all the situation you apply Bayes theorem whether it's in estimation or testing and of course more on this as the lectures go on so what we look at it the main advantage is uh, well wh whichever um, aspect you look at it whether it's with respect to the amount of information that is used which should be intuitively more applicable or whether you look at the kind of answers that can be provided or whether you have a unity of approach at the Bayesian approach seems to stand out much better than the classical approach okay well we talked about prior distribution which is really the most exciting and the challenging area of work a lot of work has been done in this area well it's easier to say that well you know if you're a researcher then you have some idea about as to uh, what the possible values your parameter could take but the point is you need to put it in the form of you need to specify it in the form of prior distribution specification of a prior distribution is one of the most challenging and most difficult task among the base for the Bayesians um, well of course uh, uh, I, I would like to um, describe this which um, what I read in one of the interviews that David Blackwell had given for the Journal of Statistical Science uh, the point at which he actually converted to the Bayesian approach mm, it seems in the early 50s when there was uh, when the Cold War was at its peak uh, the Pentagon approached Professor David Blackwell very um, renowned statistician one of the early Bayesians he was working at a university in uh, Washington DC the Defense Department of the US approached him and asked him a very simple question well you see we have a very difficult uh, situation here we would like to allocate our budget between you know on the defense uh, uh, on the long-range missiles or on the short-term defense equipment and of course what he said they wanted to know from Professor David Blackwell could he really tell them what is the probability of a nuclear war uh, Professor David Blackwell laughed it seems and he sent them away well that's a very silly question if there is a nuclear war the probability is one if there is no war the probability is zero and he sent them back um, it seems after he sent them he realized that 
you know that his answer really did not make much sense. He said the Defense Department had really approached him thinking that he is a great probabilist and that he should be able to provide an answer to that. And he wondered that he really did not have an answer because he always thought in terms of probability as a frequent, in the terms of the limit of the relative frequency. And of course, he really did not have an answer to that. And it seems he went back and look at, looked at the book the, by Jimmy Savage, Foundations of Statistics, and he realized that, well, he, found, he saw the light, he found the answer, and in fact, he called them back and he said, well, I think I perhaps would be able to help you out with that. And of course, there is a lot of work on that. There's a very nice paper by uh, Professor Rad, um, James Press on the prior probabilities of nuclear war. And of course, but you can see that this is a very difficult question to answer to specify prior probabilities. Um, but as I mentioned, this is the most exciting and challenging area of work. And of course, economists are always going to be worried about this, because when you build an eco uh, econometric model, you have large number of parameters. How are you going to specify uh, prior information? How are you going to specify, translate that prior information in the form of prior distribution for all these parameters? Well, that's an area uh, that, again, this is something that would be covered later on in the lectures. But let me just, again, uh, go over some of the basic steps in this. Uh, well, as I said, a lot of research and work has been done in the last four decades. But there are still many open problems that exist with respect to the specification of prior distribution, and particularly when it comes to the multi-parameter situation. Uh, broadly speaking, you could divide your uh, the, this prior distribution, the concept of prior distribution can be specified. It can be divided into two areas. One, which is the non-informative priors. I'll talk about it, what it is. And the other, what we call as the informative priors. Well, non-informative priors are generally very, seem very nice, very easy to handle, because you can also overcome the usual criticism that perhaps the Bayesians tend to become very subjective. Well, what is non-informative prior? This really goes back to Bayes, Laplace, the uh, many a times you begin your research, and all that you really say is that, well, I have to specify a prior distribution. Well, I really know nothing about what the parameter is, is going to be. I don't know anything about the value of the parameter. Well, of course, the answer to that is, uh, which, is which works out very well, which is the most pragmatic solution is that, well, there is never a situation of a zero information. That's really what the point is. There is always something that you can, however little the information may be, all that you could perhaps say is that a parameter can take any value over a wide possible range. You can all that you can say over the entire real line. Or it, if you know it's strictly positive, then it could be anywhere between zero and infinity. And of course, there is um, more details on this on the non-informative prior. I'm sure it would be coming up in Professor Zellner's lecture tomorrow, where he's going to talk about non-informative priors. And of course, his very beautiful maximal data information priors, uh, which also seem to take care of the general problem that arises with the first two kind of uniform priors, are uh, the Jeffrey's invariance priors sometimes, which, which is because of the improper priors, sometimes may lead to the problem of improper posteriors, that is taken care of by this Zellner's um, maximal data information priors. More on this that will be covered in the uh, lectures. Uh, there is also, um, well, very well known uh, work by uh, Jose Bernardo in 1979, where he introduced the concept of reference prior. And uh, this, strictly speaking, falls into this non informative priors. More on this would be covered by Professor J.K. Ghosh in his lectures when he develops the whole concept of model selection. He would really begin with the work on the reference prior. Well, what, what I was trying to convey to you is that although you, we say that you could have situations where you really have very little information, but even to be able to use Bayesian approach and to be able to have prior distribution in situations where you have very little information, you, we have a range of possibilities which can have worked very well in many situations, and which, of course, you would be getting to know in the various lectures that would be coming along in this program. And of course, while intuitively most of you would think that 
informative prior is something which must work very well because you see it's possible that you take up a problem about a parameter something is already known it could be either the historical data based or it could be some other source of information that informative prior would seem to work very well um, a very simple answer to that or a quick answer that I'll provide now and the others would be covering it later on in more detail is an important informative prior is what's known as the natural conjugate prior, or in short, NCP. So what is a natural conjugate prior? Well, one of the problems that we will come across, we'll look at it in the Bayesian work, is that um, they do get sometimes mathematically very difficult to handle. Analytical solutions become difficult. So in, uh, and of course, we have to look for other alternate ways of trying to get the answer. Well, mathematically, if you could think of a prior in some kind of a nice closed mathematical form, that if you combine it with your data and the posterior also happens to come out to be a nice mathematical well-known distribution that you know, then of course it's going to solve all problems. So a posterior, if the posterior distribution belongs to the same family of distribution as the prior distribution, this is known as the natural conjugate prior. Well, as you can see, they're mathematically convenient. What else? Well, I have here listed out some natural conjugate prior distributions, depending on what sampling distribution you have. What is a, a well-known or a useful natural conjugate prior which makes your life simpler? So if you're working with a binomial distribution, your data distribution is binomial. Then for the success probability, use the beta distribution, and the posterior will also be a beta distribution. Well, that's, that's really the point of specifying it here. If you work with a negative binomial data distribution, success probability is, you specify as a beta, the posterior distribution would be beta. For a Poisson, if the mean is gamma, uh, sorry, for the Poisson, the prior distribution for mean is gamma, and the posterior would also be gamma. Um, the most common situation that a lot of you work with, you have a normal distribution, well again simple situation, known variance, unknown mean. So you're only really trying to estimate the unknown parameter, uh, that's the mean of the distribution and the natural conjugate prior, the prior for that is normal, the result would be the posterior distribution is normal and of course so long as you work with normal distribution, life is very easy and works, everything works out very neat and convenient. Um, while from, and if you have a normal with known mean and unknown variance, then for the variance, the prior, natural conjugate prior is inverted gamma. The posterior also belongs to the same family. Now looking at this, of course, it might tempt you that it may be very nice to work with natural conjugate priors because it seems to pro come out very nicely. But we find that really in most of the, well, when you actually take a real life problem, you find that in application, um, you're always working with non-standard situations, non-normal distributions, and in which case, these nice results uh, generally uh, do not work so well. But of course, if you're going to begin with some problem, as a beginner, it's quite convenient and it's possible to work with natural conjugate priors. Um, okay, well, I just worked out, um, instead of all the description, I also worked out and wrote here um, a simple example. So if you have a data distribution normal with mean theta, variance sigma squared, both unknown. We're just trying to be a little brave and trying to proceed from a single parameter to a two parameter situation. Both unknown, well, likelihood function looks very familiar. All of you are familiar with it. You work with maximum likelihood estimators and uh, least squares, and you see that this is what the likelihood function looks like. Well, the, when you really get down to the task, the question is, how do you specify your prior distribution? Well, the prior distribution, let's take the case where we are working with only non-informative priors, that's the case that I would really look at it and I find that in most um, problems dealing with econometric models, uh, finds that it's generally more convenient to work and pragmatic to work with non-informative priors and they have worked very well. Uh, this is something I'm sure this is uh, going to be discussed a little later in lectures on the problem which comes up, the location and scale parameter. 
because I'm going to talk about this problem towards the later part of my lecture. Uh, in a normal setup, you have this location and scale parameter. You have mu and sigma square, mean and variance, location and scale parameter. Now, of course, what is suggested, what is usually done, and it looks very convenient to work with, that assume prior independence. You assume that the mean and the variance are a priori independent. Because now we are moving to two parameter situation, then we really need to extend the Bayes theorem to two parameter case. We, are, we need to specify prior not for just one parameter. We need to specify prior for two parameters, theta and sigma. And of course, if you assume prior independence, the very simple result from probability, we know that it can be written as a product of the two, their individual priors, pay theta and pay sigma. And a uniform prior as well as um, uh, Jeffrey's invariance prior gives us that you have the prior uh, is proportional to um, is 1 over sigma, so our sigma inverse. Well, this is what has been generally worked with. But of course, um, well, I should have actually described uh, what the Jeffrey's invariance prior. I will, well, let's look, talk about that first. Well, the Jeffrey's prior in a multi-parameter situation tells us that the prior distribution is proportional to the square root of the determinant of the information matrix, the Fisher's information matrix. Now, um, if you assume prior independence, then of course it again works out to be very nice, and the pay theta sigma is nothing but proportional to sig uh, 1 over sigma. But of course, if you don't assume prior independence, and I'll give you an example where this may not be possible to do so. What you find is that the joint prior is proportional to 1 over sigma squared, not 1 over sigma. And of course, this does cause further problem when you go on to getting your posterior distribution. So this is something that we really need to be aware of. We need to realize that even in a simple two-parameter situation, we must be very careful the number of the parameters that we're dealing with they, if they can be classified strictly as location and scale parameter, and what should be, and how to handle whether the assumption of prior independence is justifiable or not. So the question really is, should you have a prior on sigma or sigma squared? This is another set of, this is another kind of problems that would arise in, with respect to specification of prior distribution, and I'm sure Professor Zellner would talk about it in his lecture tomorrow. Uh, will the posterior be same? Uh, whether you begin with sigma or sigma square and you want to get the posterior distribution for sigma or sigma square. Either way, okay. Now, while working with the simple model that I specified earlier, nothing much, I just put back this transparency. This is what we have, simple two parameter situation. We take the prior as sigma uh, proportional to one over sigma. So what is the joint posterior? Now, of course, you look at it, I'm using a different, it's not just a posterior distribution. Now, you have two parameters. We should remember to specify it's a joint posterior for the parameters theta and sigma. So now we have a slightly uh, difficult situation than if we have a single parameter set up. Well, the joint posterior distribution, well, looks like this, works out to, doesn't look that bad, but the question is, what are we really going to do with it? So if you have a joint distribution, you're really thinking in terms of, you're not looking in terms of just the univariate. You have two parameter situation, now you can only talk about the contours of the joint distribution. We have here several, pro well, there are several stages that we will have to deal with. One is that, can we really think in terms of, again, a univariate situation or the component distribution of that? Because this is what is really of most interest to you trying to talk about a single parameter at a time. So what are the component distributions? Again, just the basic probability theory that tells us you have a joint distribution of theta and sigma. You can always write it as a product of the conditional and the marginal. And of course, here, what do we have? It's a posterior distribution. So you are writing it as a product of a conditional posterior times a marginal. The question always is, would you be always able to write this as conveniently as this? And would you be able to come up with a nice marginal posterior, um, a nice uh, closed form for a posterior distribution, or would there be other problems? Uh, of course, this is another way of rewriting. If you are interested in getting a marginal for sigma, 
then you write it in this way and if you want to get a marginal posterior for theta you write it in this form the question is can we really do that uh, well in this simple situation we have a simple answer as well the po marginal posterior for theta comes out very neat and it's in the form of a student t distribution all these results I'll give you a set of references some basic references which are always going to be form the basis of studies and the paper the, which has been given to you in the bound volume by Professor Zellner has the most extensive list of references on the subject of Bayesian econometrics and Bayesian statistics and of course uh, I will only give you at the end some references which are very very basic for the work on Bayesian statistics and econometrics. Well this comes out in the form of students t distribution. Um, so what do we have? We get a posterior distribution, not only at just a point at an interval estimate. We're going to get a whole distribution. And if you want to even provide an estimate, this is an area well, when you want to provide an estimate, the question is we bring in the notions of Bayesian decision theory. We want to talk about, uh, we, you, you are still interested in getting one particular value. You want to get a point estimate. In the Bayesian decision theory, this is an area which Professor Prem Goyal would be talking about, and he will discuss about how we can actually get uh, the best Bayes estimates and how they can be used. And if you want to get an interval, then you have the high posterior density regions are intervals that can be constructed. And through the course of lectures, whatever thing that's being covered by all the speakers, you would uh, there would be examples which would be covering this area as well. So it's. If you really want to get an estimate, the Bayesians also provide you an estimate, and in fact, perhaps with a better intuitive feeling than what the classes it would, would provide. And the question is, if you extend further to a k-parameter situation, uh, I'm thinking more in terms of you're working with a multiple regression model, multiple regression, you have k-parameters, and of course, if you have k-parameters, you want to have you, while as a classicist you want to have an estimate for each one of them, or as a Bayesian you want to have a distribution, a posterior distribution for each one of those parameters. Well, what should we do? You get a joint posterior PDF, it's much easier to obtain. You have a data times a prior, you get a joint posterior. <coughs> K dimensions, the question is, would you be able to get a marginal? Is it feasible to get um, a marginal? Uh, analytically, is it feasible to do that? And if it's not feasible analytically, then what do we have? Well, this is an area which has been very challenging, again, other than the specification of prior, is on the Bayesian computing methods. In fact, a lot of people were generally discouraged by, you know, trying venturing into Bayesian methods because uh, we always had this problem that you get this joint posterior and then, of course, you really, one doesn't know how to go about it if you don't have a neat analytical solution. Uh, of course, numerical integration is one solution, but we know that if you get into higher dimensions, this is not going to work very well. Important sampling, which has been used and tried, has worked very well in many situations. And of course, now we have the well-known Monte Carlo Markov chain Monte Carlo methods, which are, in fact, because of that, the Bayesians have become very brave. We don't really think about how many parameters we have. We deal with hundreds and even sometimes thousands of parameters together and still come up with the answers. And Professor Bill Griffiths, as well as Professor Palasik, are going to discuss this in detail in relation to regression model, seemingly unrelated related regression models, as well as for the time series models that Professor Palasik is going to talk about. So, but the point is that we now we do have solutions. And of course, all that we need to do is to just venture into this try to get the relevant software and work with it. And we have the solution. So we really don't have to m worry about that. But economists certainly don't want to venture into much larger models. We have just heard this morning, just large models by themselves need not have any value. What's important is begin with a simple model. And of course, uh, for that, uh, there is no, um, nothing stopping you from, nothing will stop you from working with a simple model, even if you work with a Bayesian technique to begin with. Uh, okay, um, well, yes, I have already talked about, but I have written 
Bayesian testing and model selection. I think this is an area which concerns the econometricians a lot more than just the statisticians because uh, well now they're uh, aware of it but if you realize as econometricians the question of model selection was always a very important one. Uh, to a statisticians generally work with a model well whatever mod whichever model they work with they always said well this is the model and these are the results. But of course you know when it comes to econometric models we have so many economic theories and every theory leads to another model and then to come to a consensus or even come to uh, uh, to arrive at a decision well this model will work better in a particular situation it always required that you should be able to compare models and that has led a research into the area of um, non-nested hypothesis well classical econometrics if you look at it there's been a lot of work on the non-nested hypothesis this is an area that has been developed only by econometricians but of course if you look at it how they work um, well, there are uh, the, the original work of Cox, which was further developed by uh, Dayton and Pesarin. Many papers have appeared, but if you look at it, how well they work. In fact, uh, empirically, there are so many contradictions when you use the classical test, test for the non-nested <coughs> hypothesis that the only solution in that situation is the Bayesian solution. Because the Bayesian solution looks at it, looking at it in terms of the what is the posterior probability of a given hypothesis? And of course, the simple problem that the uh, well, a beginner economist would work with, you have a regression model y is x beta plus u log y. So if you have a dependent variable different from y to log y, you suddenly say, well, you, have, you work with r square, and you say that you know finally that it's not really very good. Even in a simple situation, you would not really be able to provide a neat answer. So what you really need to work with a technique of model selection, which will work in all situations. You want to have posterior probabilities of hypothesis and compare. Uh, but we have the concept of Bayesian posterior odds. That is the solution. That is the Bayesian solution to problem of model selection. So you have, which of course, um, it uh, the posterior odds, which is the ratio of the posterior probability of these two hypotheses, is nothing but you have the prior odds on the hypothesis. And what we have is the base factor. Again, this is an area, this topic, which will be covered uh, later on by the lectures of Professor J.K. Ghosh. I will just leave it at that. The point that I want to make it is that the Bayesians have a neat, neat solution, uh, which is applicable whether you're working with nested or non-nested hypothesis. <coughs> well, uh, I must talk about this uh, problem, which has, uh, uh, with, with the problem with which I have worked, and of course, uh, takes me back again to the location and scale parameter that I talked about with respect to the prior distribution. Consider a regression model. Uh, the economists have really worked with this model in many situations when it comes to whether analyzing production or expenditure, and that you have a situation where you have the expected value is x beta, where the variance is a function of the expected value of y. Well, of course, if you look at it, then the variance is also a function of x beta. And now what we find is, well, you may have, while it's proportional to this, you have a constant k here. But if you look at it, your regression parameter beta, it appears is a, in the location as well as in the scale term. Now, the question is, how in this kind of a multi-parameter situation, how do we go about specifying a non-informative prior? And if we assume prior independence, between beta and this constant k and try to specify a prior, what would be the result? This is a problem which, of course, um, I have worked with it and has given me always, uh, well, it's still not completely resolved. We, I have come up with some kind of ad hoc solution, but this is something that we need to look at it. And I'm sure this kind of problems arise in econometrics all the time. So we have to look at it, the specification of prior distribution, particularly where the location and scale parameter concept is not very distinctly um, specified. Uh, well, yes, if the location and scale parameters uh, cannot be assumed independent, but if you do assume independence, then the non-informative priors have led to inconsistent posteriors, uh, 
while those who are interested, I perhaps would uh, give them uh, some leading material on this topic. The other problem which still um, intrigues uh, many econometricians who work with this is that of the improper posterior. I did talk about it in the uh, beginning. I referred to it. What do you, well, if you take a non-informative prior, you may have situations when you combine it with the likelihood where the data distribution is rather flat, but your prior distribution is non-informative, but seems to dominate the data distribution. And what is the result? You end up with improper posteriors. Um, this is a problem which goes back to earlier one paper, the 1965. But of course, this problem does keep recurring. So if you, one solution is, as Professor Zellner would suggest, is that you always use the maximal data information prior. But we will uh, learn more about it uh, tomorrow and in the other lectures. Well, it looks like that uh, I need to sum up. But before I do that, I have to uh, give you a list of references. Uh, as I call them, references forever. Because, um, well, I'll have to first begin with uh, the book on Bayesian econometrics, which was, of course, written way back in 1971, still serves as the basic book for learning Bayesian methods in econometrics. And that's by Professor Arnold Zellner, Introduction to Bayesian Inference. I must warn you, the book is out of print. And um, the, while it's not available in India, we have been trying to get. We have only one copy. You've not been able to get that. Uh, so of course, either you will uh, have to approach your publishers again to see if we can get some more copies. Several people have told me that this, they are not able to get. 1996. OK, well, so. I think we should be, the, your 1997 book that you told me, actually, it's been six months that I've been trying to get that I refer to it later. Yes, no, no. It, well, we will try this. Thank you for this information. But it seems that it has been reprinted. So it should be available. And of course, um, I strongly recommend that your libraries must possess a copy of this book, um, which is reprinted in 1996. Well, I'll add to it. Well, the other book which has been always very helpful, very useful for the basics, uh, which covers a wide spectrum of topics, is the book by George Box and Chiao, Bayesian Inference and Statistical Analysis, 1973, Edison Wesley. A um, book which came out in 1979, which again covers a lot of the basic stuff on Bayesian statistics. Uh, I must say that this is. This is, I'm only talking about some very basic references. The big list is available in Professor Zellner's paper. So I really did not want to repeat it here. Um, but if you're going to get some basic books, uh, this is some of my suggestions. And of course, the other speakers would be talking about it. And I'm sure they're supplemented. They will provide us um, books which are more, uh, you know, uh, which will supplement this and perhaps uh, some of, uh, you know, which, which would be good supplement to the references I'm mentioning. And the fourth one, which is uh, a collection of uh, Professor Zellner's papers and work on Bayesian econometrics and statistics. This uh, book published in 1997, a very important <coughs> reference. Again, uh, Edward Elgar Publishers, 1997. Again, um, I strongly recommend that you uh, tell your organization, your library, your university library, and so on to get this. It has, um, um, it, it doesn't have all the papers, Professor Zellner, only some of them, right? Am I right? It doesn't have all your papers. No. The long list is 197 that I last saw on the website, plus, of course, several books. But this certainly would be a good, useful uh, book to keep with you. Uh, to begin your work on uh, Bayesian methods. Um, well. I really, uh, as I started my lecture, and I would like to end again with that, that if you wanted to learn music, one hour is not enough. If you want to learn Bayesian methods, one hour is certainly not enough. And the Bayesian basics being a vast ocean, and I really couldn't put it in just a small bottle. So what I try to do is to just go over trying to bring you into the Bayesian world by just talking about the basic toolkit. And again, trying to pose some of the problems 
which will be covered in detail by our distinguished speakers in a series of lectures. And of course, some of you have perhaps uh, not seen the website where we have been putting the details of the lectures. I would strongly suggest, recommend, well, we do have our computer center is available uh, to be used by all of you. Uh, in fact, there is also email facility, internet facility that you can have. But other than that, those of you who are, in fact, many people have asked me as to, I haven't given the, uh, described the details of the lectures in the program. That's because I presume that most of you have really seen the website. The details of the series of lectures are already provided there. So if you really have any questions, well, you can check it out this afternoon and so on.